Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. We hope you've been with us before, but in case you haven't, this is a series of lessons, which is, we follow basically the lessons prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church for the first three months of 2014. It's a series entitled Discipleship, and this is lesson number two in that series entitled Discipling Through Metaphor. What do metaphors and parables and stories, what do they teach us about the gospel and how did Jesus use them to teach biblical truth? This is the lesson for January 11 of 2014 and we hope you have your Bible handy with you and if you have been to our website you may also have our materials handy there and you can follow along as we study this lesson. But before we begin, let's have a word of prayer together. Our wonderful Father, how can we be thankful enough for all the wonderful truths that you have taught us through parables, through metaphors, through stories? In fact, it's easy to regard the Bible as a storybook. So many stories from here and there, and each one with a different background, and each one with a different message. May we learn from them. May we learn the lessons you intend for us to learn is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I don't think anyone could deny the fact that Jesus was a master storyteller. He saw in ordinary things of life among the people of ancient Palestine many common things which could be used to illustrate spiritual truths. And what's the advantage of something like that? Why, why would Jesus do that? So you could relate to them. Okay, and? Remember them. Remember them. Why, why do you say remember them? You remember stories. You remember pictures. Mm -hmm. He's talking about a farmer, and they see a farmer every day. They think of that story. If they, yeah. if they are a farmer. Yeah. Yeah. So if you teach stories, and you teach important truths based on common things that people see every day, it's your hope that what happens? Every time they see that, that event or that item or whatever, they're going to do what? They're going to think about the lesson that you taught, right? Jesus is talking about a reasonable, rational, logical religion. He's challenging us to think, imagine that. More than that, he realized that humans are capable of doing some other things, loving and feeling and hurting and crying and caring and laughing and imagining. And he's asking us to do what? He's asking us to use all of those capacities, all those, he, he wants us to he doesn't want us to just learn hard, cold facts. He wants us to learn things that have meanings, that have, I mean, all of us have been in situations where a story is told of something like this and it brings you to tears. Or a story that bring, makes you so excited, you're, you want to stand up and wave your hands. Uh, and and what, what's, the, what's the implication of doing something like that? Well, by telling these stories and making us read between the lines. Yes. He was trying to make us think. Mm-hmm. What a dreadful idea, right? Uh, not, be so, not be so much uh, chemistry majors, but English majors. Well, what did... Uh, can you think of anybody who, who told stories to, to teach spiritual truths in the Old Testament? Lots of people. Lots of the prophets. There's, yeah, lots of prophets. There's one that is quite interesting in this context. Look at 2 Samuel 12, the first seven verses. The Lord sent the prophet Nathan to David. Nathan went to him and said, There were two men who lived in the same town. One was rich and the other one poor. The rich man had many cattle and sheep, while the poor man had only one lamb which he had bought. He took care of it, and it grew up in his home with his children. He would feed it with some of his own food, let it drink from his cup, and hold it in his lap. The lamb was like a daughter to him. One day, a visitor arrived at the rich man's home. The rich man didn't want to kill one of his own animals to prepare a meal for him. Instead, he took the poor man's lamb and cooked a meal for his guest. David was very angry with the rich man and said, I swear by the living Lord that the man who did this ought to die. For having done such a cruel thing, he must pay back four times as much as he took. 
And what did Nathan say? It's you, you are the one. You are the man. Nathan said to David, and this is what the Lord God of Israel says, and so forth. And he was talking about the fact that he had destroyed or killed Uriah and taken his wife, right? So there's a very clear example of using a story to do what? To get someone's thinking in a certain line and then say, okay, mm -hmm. bang, here's the punchline, right? Later on, Ken, um, <clears throat> in the history of Israel, we get into uh, um, situations where prophets um, or people were selected by God, depending upon their particular situation. <clears throat> and they went so far as not just to tell the story, but they acted out those stories. Uh, one that I'm thinking of uh, specifically, and I think it's a proper application, would be Hosea, mm -hmm. where he was told to marry this prostitute and so on and so forth. Why, why any idea why, uh, why they were instructed to, to actually um, and I think, uh, uh, um, you know, there's some other, yeah. uh, other Old Testament prophets that did similar things. They acted this well, thing out. What about Jonah, <clears throat> for example? I mean, he was told to go and do things, wasn't he? And in Hosea, you know, we say, well, what, you know, what about this? And what's he doing marrying a prostitute? If you look at the situation in his day, there may have been nothing but prostitutes to marry. So, so what was the, why not, why not use, uh, why not send these people like a Nathan mm -hmm. to, to, to tell the story? Any idea or hints as to why God might have had these people actually act these things, act these things out? Do you think the story would be more meaningful if it's acted out than if it's just told? Well, it possibly, and I guess maybe I'm, I'm wondering, maybe you know, if things were so bad that just telling a story wouldn't work. You know, maybe you needed something more dramatic. Yeah, or, and Hosea, for example, lived only 10 years before the nation of Israel was completely wiped out and disappears from history. So I would say that's a, probably a time when you need to have the maximum, if you're going to have any effect at all, you need to have maximum impact, right? Yeah. Uh, I've always liked parable because it's, uh, it teaches you things because it's his uh, heuristic way of teaching because it takes you time to absorb it before you get angry. Had Nathan just said, David, he could have just wanted to just kill him, but he let that marinate it and he realized he saw something that he didn't even realize was in him. He probably was just acting without really realizing, oh my God, this is what I've become. Well, the impact of the story in the case of David here was uh, it engaged David in the story. And uh, he actually became, um, a, he not only was the subject, but he actually became involved in the story with his actions. And then yeah, it was very interesting. Yeah. Well, it turns out that Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, just to mention a few, had major prophecies about the problems that the children of Israel were facing and so forth like this, and some of those prophecies were acted out. Ezekiel went around for a while with no clothes on. Isaiah, I mean, and other things like that. And, and, and did they do this at the risk of their lives? What happened to Isaiah? Well, tradition doesn't tradition say they stuffed him in a log and sawed him in two. When Man Manasseh came along, he stuffed Isaiah into a hollow log and sawed him in two. Yep. What happened to Ezekiel? He was taken prisoner. What happened to Jeremiah? He was threatened with death, thrown into a pit, etc. And, uh, you know, several times he was threatened to death. Remember that they, he was told Get out of here! Are you, are you, if the king finds out where you are, you're gonna—he's gonna kill you. I mean, you know, this is serious stuff. Well, is it serious to them because they were so effective? Possibly, I mean, very likely. You know, we're, we're kind of talking like this is kind of exotic, but I wonder if this is just naturally what a good teacher would do, because I—I I remember through school. 
the boring teachers and the good teachers. Yeah. The good teachers were the ones that, that could apply everything they were talking about, bring it, bring it home to real life and things like that. Funny stories, they all, you know, it's just the difference between a boring teacher ba basically than a, than a good teacher where you actually get into what he's saying. Yeah. Well, what about it? Do you have a favorite parable or story or passage in Scripture? We're not going to ask you to take your time, but think about it. And what is it about that story or passage or whatever that appeals to you? Why is it your favorite? Let's, let's take one and pull Yeah, go ahead. I like the fig tree because at first I didn't understand it. <coughs> Excuse me. The fig mm -hmm. tree parable. Until I, uh, it, I like that one a lot. I like all of Jesus' mm -hmm. parables. Oh, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Well, look at one. You remember very well the story about the two houses. One was built on the rock, one built on the sand. Look at Matthew 7, 24 to 27. So then anyone who hears these words of mine and obeys them is like a wise man who built his house on rock. The rain poured down, the rivers overflowed, and the wind blew hard against that house. But it did not fall because it was built on what? A rock. But anyone who hears these words of mine and does not obey them is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. <coughs> rain poured down, the rivers overflowed, and what happened? The wind blew hard against that house and it <coughs> fell. You know, we, I'm sure you sing songs about when you were a kid and it crashed down, right? Mm -hmm. And what a terrible fall that was. So, why would Jesus... Let's, let's try to put ourselves back into the situation that they were in. To the Jews who first told this story, what was the rock? Something solid. Okay, something solid. In, in their religion, in their thinking, what was solid? The foundation stone wasn't that, that was important okay. to them. Yeah. The Bible. The Bible. The Bible was their rock. Well, even before the Bible, in their day, no, I shouldn't say before the Bible, but to them, what was the centerpiece of their religion? It was a temple in Jerusalem. And what was that temple built on? A solid rock, right? And when the disciples came to Jesus in Matthew 24, Jesus said, you know, things are going to fall apart here. And they said, look! I mean, this built on a solid rock, and it's made out of these huge rocks, and look at it, it's a beautiful temple. How could anything happen to that temple? And Jesus said, what? Not one stone is going to be left on top of another. And why did it get torn apart? Remember? Because of the gold. In it. it burned, and the gold melted, and ran down between the cracks, and of course, what happened when it finally cooled off? If you move the stone around, you pull out some gold, right? Yeah. It's it's something how these these ideas transfer into other things. Mm -hmm. I mean, you talked about the temple, but we don't know anything about a temple. No. Yet we read that and we understand, you know, the difference between a rock and a and the sandy soil. Yes. And that kind of thing, and and the truth versus lies. You know, they all they they there's transferable. Mm -hmm. Idea. Knowledge, ideas about those things. Yeah. And we, don't ask me how we can do that. Well, the answer else. is Paul did it for us in the book of Hebrews. He said, don't put your faith anymore in those things that are perishable. He said, who is the one you need to put your faith in? Jesus Christ. And how are you going to put your faith in Jesus Christ? You're going to read the stories about him. You're going to read the New Testament stories. That's where you need to put your... And when the Jewish nation was overthrown and the temple was brought down and the whole thing was turned into a pile of rubble, what did the Jews have to hold on to? Scripture. And so it became a nation of Bible-believing people. I mean, that's what they... Even today, if you, if you talk to a Jew, what, what is their core idea? Well, they, they have a common religion. Now, we might disagree with some of the things they believe and some of their interpretations of Scripture, but they turned, finally, that for a couple hundred years they had a big argument with Christians about who was going to control the Greek translation of the, of the Old Testament. 
because the Greek was a language everybody was speaking, and the, the Hebrews wanted to, attack, to interpret it their way, and the Christians wanted to interpret it their way, and there was almost a knockdown, drag out fight between how, whether the Jews are going to be allowed to, to interpret the scripture their way, and, or the Christians, and what actually happened at the end of that knockdown, drag out fight, the, the number of Christians kept exploding, and the number of Jews kept shrinking, and so pretty soon the Christians said, we're just taking over. This, this is our Bible. It's going to be our, you know, our, we're going to do it our way. And the Jews said, okay, if that's what you're going to do, oh, we'll go back to our Hebrew. And the Hebrew Bible will be, of course, very few of the Christians could read Hebrew, so they, there was no argument about that. So the Jews ended up with their Hebrew Bible, and Christians ended up with the Greek Bible, which pretty soon got it translated into Latin. And so the Latin Bible called the Vulgate. Vulgate became the standard for Christianity, and the <coughs> Torah, the the book of the old, the, the whole Old Testament, basically became the Hebrew Bible in Hebrew. And at times, the interpretations of those were quite widely separated. The way they were, the but way the, the meaning of the two Bibles were were pretty close. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no doubt about it. It's the interpretation that comes out a little different. So now, let's think about why Jesus would use parables, because that's our subject for this time. How many people in Jesus' day could, I mean, did Jesus hand out copies of his notes when he preached his sermon? No, he put them on the internet. He put them on, <laughs> yeah, okay. What did right, he do? right alongside our materials. Right alongside our <laughs> materials, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, very few of the people could even read and write. I mean, you were a scholar if you could read and write. Okay? So how are you going to communicate with a lot of people who can't even read and write? So they memorized the scripture, but they couldn't read it, many of them. Well, the people who memorized it probably got to the place where they could read it pretty well. But a lot of people couldn't. There were, I mean, while that was the ideal, I'm sure there were a lot of people who didn't manage to do all that. So what did they do? They had to listen, and they had to try to remember what they heard, the stories. Okay, And those stories can be understood in various ways. If you look at the parables of Jesus, the amazing thing about them is they can be understood at a child level, they can be understood at an intermediate level sometimes, and then if you keep digging and keep digging, it goes deeper and deeper and deeper. I'm going higher instead of deeper, but anyway. Uh, you know, that's the way it was. There's so many ways to interpret those stories. Did what? Was uh, were the telling of parables and metaphors and stories like this was this uh, was this common? Yes, a common method. And so yes. it, when we read it in the New Testament, Jesus telling his parables, we shouldn't conclude that he was the only one that went around telling parables. Would that be? No, but the way he told his parables and the point of his parables was very different. <clears throat> he used very common things, and I mean. You don't have to be any. You don't even have to know about farming hardly at all to recognize when when you read the stories about the, the agrarian or the farmer kind of stories in, that Jesus told. I mean, at least the basic level of its meaning just pops out. I mean, you can't miss it, right? Matthew thirteen thirty four. He says, "All this Jesus said to the crowds in parables. Indeed, he said nothing to them without a parable." This was to fill, fill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. So Now there's another reason why he did it. Another really well, more important reason why he did it. What that's was that? a little bit earlier up in verse 13. Mm -hmm. This is why he spoke to them in parables. Because seeing they do not see and hearing they do not hear nor do they understand. Mm -hmm. With them indeed is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah which says... Of course, then you wait clear down to the time in the upper room. He says, now I'm not going to talk to you in parables and figures of speech. I'm going to tell you plainly about the Father. And but look at the other, excuse me, look at the other side of that. Who, who, what kind of people were always in his crowds? Those who were trying to trip him up. Yeah. And so if you tell a story, even if the, the, the lesson from the story is patently clear, you just told a story, right? How, can, how could the Pharisees condemn me? They knew what he, was, what he was saying. And the people knew what he was saying. But it's hard to say, 
you told a story and therefore we should kill you. you know? Just like Nathan to David. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I One? think that's very minor though. I think, that's, I think that's a, a byproduct of, of what really needs to happen with the, the parables. Mm -hmm. I, think the, I think the things of God are very deep. They're, they go beyond words. And you have, to, you have to use metaphors. But if you go back, you go back and read John 2, you will discover that already in the very early stages of his ministry, they were planning to kill him. So Jesus had to have that always in the back of his mind. They were always looking for something. If he had stood up and said, you know, which he finally did, when did he finally stand up and said, you whited sepulchres, da, 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 when did he say that? Do you remember? Well, I, he did Two days before they crucified, three days before they crucified him. Yeah. Okay? <laughs> they weren't going to put up with that kind of stuff for very long. But some of these stories... Jesus mentioned that um, these riddles he told um, were to be a puzzle to others, but he was now going to speak plainly to his disciples. So if he was trying to communicate these stories and the great lessons, then why were some of them so mysterious to the very people that he was trying to? Well, I, I think if you look at those mysterious ones, they're usually bad news. <laughs> exactly. I mean, it's like, it's like his crucifixion. I mean, if he told them everything that was going to happen, they would be, I mean, it would be bad news. I mean, it's really bad news. So he tells them enough to let them know that he knew about it before it actually happened. I mean, and so I think that's really where dark speech comes in because when he was talking about, you know, his crucifixion, he was talking to them, and, they, and it, the Bible says that they, they weren't understanding what he was talking about. But he wasn't speaking parables and riddles when that happened. He oh, was speaking he to wasn't? The, he was, well, let me, let me give you an example. Look, look, at, look at Luke. Uh, it was all metaphors and everything. Look at um, Luke 18. I challenge you. Look at Luke 18, and I just lost my place here. Luke 18 starting from verse, verse 31. I'm still trying to get things in here that I didn't want in here. There. Jesus took, now this is, a, if you look at the context, they are on their way from Jericho, climbing up the mountain to Jerusalem, and Jesus knows one week later he's going to be dead. Okay? Jesus knows that. And this is what he said. Jesus took the 12 disciples aside and said to them, listen, we are going to Jerusalem. Does this sound like a parable, or is he speaking plainly? Where everything the prophets wrote about the Son of Man will come true. He will be handed over to the Gentiles, who will mock him, insult him, and spit on him. Does this sound like a parable? They will whip him and kill him, but three days later he will rise to life. Is that the parable? No. But the disciples did not understand any of these things. The meaning of the words was hidden from them, and they did not know what Jesus was talking about. What was the problem? Dark speech. Okay, what do we mean when we say <laughs> dark speech? It just didn't fit their paradigm. They okay, that's, yeah. that's the point. It, was, it didn't fit the way they, they were hoping Jesus... They were so excited because they saw Jesus in all this crowd, and the crowd was cheering him on and so forth. And they were sure that on this trip from Jericho to Jerusalem, they were going to get to Jerusalem and they were going to anoint their king. But doesn't it turn into dark speech, though, <laughs> even though he's telling the truth at that time? The only reason it, it's dark speech is because it didn't fit what they, were try what they wanted to hear. You know, I th I think okay, and then and then when it was all there, over there's, with, there's nothing wrong with the speech. When it's it was all speech, over, speech is when clear. it was when it was all over with, yeah. and his crucifixion was done, he rose from the dead. Well, there was no dark speech after that. They could talk plainly after that. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm I'm really seeing here that it is like I said that that sometimes dark speech is needed. Because there's really bad news that, well, fortunately, that, that they can't take. Fortunately, in our day, we don't need any dark speech, right? Well, there's a lot of things that could be coming up. It also said, I'm going to lay down my life, 
and I'm going to take it up again. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the flip side of that is the, the uh, authorities are not going to get a, the chance or the satisfaction of killing him. And you know that now because of I mean, it's, it's all been done. Right. But yeah. he foretold and it. So it's yeah. not it's not really dark speech after it's done. Yeah, that's so. right. I think yeah. we have to be careful how we interpret that word hidden. My tendency when I read that is that well, Jesus was hiding these things somehow. And don't think so. And really the proper and proper understanding of the use of that word in this case is that when it says it was hidden. It was that they didn't understand. Yeah, that's what it is. See it. Yeah, so that's the, right. these literal words that you read about his upcoming very death, plain, they, very they straightforward, took as a parable. Yes, right. probably. Mm -hmm. he said that isn't what it really means. What does he really mean? It's be another one of those puzzling parables. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Maybe, yeah, you know, I, I kind of put that little parable clear back to with Exodus six six a parallel. When God was telling the children of Israel, He'd take them out of Israel, uh, came out of Egypt, mm -hmm. and with a strong arm, He says, "But the people did not listen because of their broken spirit and cruel bondage." Well, here, this just plain what He was saying. It wasn't really it didn't they it didn't have to couch it in hidden or dark speech. It just didn't fit their way of looking at things. Yeah. They, 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 their expectations were far different. It was so different from what they were they were thinking yeah. that they huh they went huh. They're, they're, they're still thinking that there's going to huh? be a time when one of us gets to sit on the right and one of us gets yes. to sit on the left. Isaiah 6, 9 and 10. Okay, I understand 9, but 10, is he talking to the Pharisees or would this also apply to are the disciples? Isaiah, or are you talking about Isaiah 6, verse 9 and 10. Okay, let's have a look at that. Jesus is not talking there. Oh, no, Isaiah. Okay. And go on. Okay, Isaiah 6, verse 9. And 10. And 10. Mm -hmm. So he told me to go. This is God speaking to Isaiah. Mm -hmm. So he told me to go and give the people this message. No matter how much you listen, you will not understand. No matter how much you look, you will not know what is happening. Then he said to me, Make the minds of these people dull, their ears deaf, and their eyes blind, so they cannot see or hear or understand. If they did, they might turn to me and be healed. So that's what's that's interesting. It's it's almost like he's challenging them. Yes, yeah, that's saying, interesting. It's just man. like Mackay or whatever he was Mackay. saying, Mackay. That, mm -hmm. saying that. Mm -hmm. What did he say? <laughs> that's, that's an interesting one. Well, is that irony? Um, I think God is saying to Isaiah. You're going to speak a lot. This is the beginning of the book of Isaiah. I think he's saying to Isaiah, I'm going to give you a lot of messages and people are not going to want to hear virtually any of those messages. And they're going to despise you. They're going to trouble you. They're going to give you a bad time and so forth. But you have to speak. So if you're speaking something people don't want to hear, what are you doing? Just what the verses said, right? They didn't yep. want to hear. Yeah. They didn't want to hear that's why it's often say, let those who have ears hear. Mm -hmm. Some people just, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, do parables make us think? Yes. Are there any parables against things like worldly entanglements or material riches, even lifestyle things? Yes. Mm. Well, sometimes parables even come into your mind when you're doing something. I mm -hmm. mean, because you see some some similarities there. Mm -hmm. So it not only does it make you think, but it kind of calls you to thinking at a certain time. Yeah. Yeah. Well, sometimes the parables challenge us to take some pretty radical steps. Do we do we need to get into the church and say Someone's not doing what they're supposed to over here. We need to get rid of those people. Ellen White's comments on that are, are interesting. Um, in Christ's parable teaching, the same principle is seen as in his own mission to the world, that we might become acquainted with his divine character and life. Christ took our nature and dwelt among us. Divinity was revealed in humanity, the invisible glory and the visible human form. Men could learn of the unknown through the known. Heavenly things were revealed 
to the <coughs> earthly. Christ's Object Lessons, page 17. Is this, uh, is this saying that Jesus' life was a living parable? Yes. That's what it looks like, isn't it? Yeah. And they didn't want to hear it. I mean, how did the people of Nazareth relate to Jesus? Mm -hmm. When he arrived back home as the hometown hero, and he stood up and said, let me tell you something, and they said, stone him, throw him off the mm -hmm. cliff. Right? Well, look at Matthew 13, 3 to 9. This is in a whole chapter that's a sermon full of parables, isn't it? Mm -hmm. He used parables to tell them many things. Once there was a man who went out to sow corn, and corn in to the British, and this, I, I'm reading a British translation here, corn is what? Grain. Wheat. Grain, yeah. As he scattered the seed in the field, some of it fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some of it fell on rocky ground where there was little soil. The seed soon sprouted up because the soil wasn't deep. But when the sun came up, it burnt the young plants, and because the roots had not grown deep enough, the plants soon dried up. Some of the seed fell among thorn bushes, which grew up and choked the plants. But some seeds fell in good ground, and the plants produced corn. Some produced 100 grains, others 60, and others 30. Does that start to give us a hint why we're talking about this under discipleship. Mm -hmm. Where do you find yourself in this parable? Sometimes. Do you identify with the sower? Sometimes do you feel like the seed that can't just sort of almost, you know, your hands are tied, you just have to go where you're put? And, or what about the soil? Do you feel like you're one of the soils? Well, you talk about the sower. It's almost like, you know, I've been born where I've been born. There's no, there was no choice. That would be a happened. seed. Right. I got thrown in a certain place. Do you know anybody, any people who <coughs> come to church on a regular basis, but they talk sometimes about their excitement of their, their new Christian experience when they were baptized, and now it just seems like, their experience is getting colder and colder and colder. I experienced that, and then I would go and study with Mormons for a while, then I would go study, I even, I got a Quran, I read it, and I would go here and there, and, and then I'd come back again, and I've done that. Well, I see. Yeah. Been there, done that. <laughs> yeah, I've done that. Here's a question. If you had been there and listened to that parable, the parable of the sower and the parable of the, pearl, the pearl and and other things in that one chapter. Suppose you went, you were there, and you heard that sermon. What would you say? What would you so so now you're walking home with your friends. What would you say about the sermon? What did that mean? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and what would have been the answer? Fortunately, Jesus told them a few yeah. verses later. Well, he told at least the disciples. Yeah. <laughs> Whether he told everybody is another question. <coughs> yeah. Uh, are we supposed to understand them all now? So none of them are supposed to be dark speech to us, huh, Gary? <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, you know, there's. do they ever get exhausted? I mean, do you ever get a, to the point where I understand everything there is about that parable? No. Nope. No, it just keeps going on and on and on and on. So even if you could come up with some speech that says it plainly, I mean, how could that happen? Because um, then you would have the, the exact answer, mm -hmm. the right answer, and you would exhaust it. Okay, well, Jesus comes up the last week of his ministry. Turn to Matthew 21, for example, starting with verse 28. He's now in his last, actually his last day of, of preaching in the temple. And he says this, Now what do you think? There was once a man who had two sons. He went to the elder one and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. I don't want to, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. Yes, sir, he answered. But he did not go. Which one of the two did what his father wanted? And they answered, the first one. Did they soon realize what Jesus was talking about? 
after they thought about it for a while. And did they like what they heard? <laughs> Not at all, right? But could you, I mean, how can you condemn someone for telling a story? Even if you know, you don't like what the conclusions are, you know what he's talking about. I mean, you can't, you can't put him on trial for, you know, causing, or can you? For well, it sure still motivates them to, to kill him, though, doesn't it? Well. It's not a very nice thing to say about somebody. <laughs> <laughs> no, he didn't, say, he didn't say anything about anybody. He just told a story. The next well, verse. Uh, that make him, that would make him uh, open to uh, criticism for, for beating around the bush, for, for being... Uh, that was a good story. You know, there, there is a little Hinting, danger in that. Hinting, but not coming right out and saying things. There is but a danger in that, though. If you get dragged before a court, you can start interpreting anything you want. From the from the parable, he said this, and then he starts interpreting it. Oh man, it's really bad, <laughs> you know. But it's pretty so hard. I don't know. I'm not so sure if if that's all that safe. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> if you go, if you need to say that kind of a message, it's probably safer to say it like this than any other way. <laughs> But yes. the next verse after what you read, when he say, uh, surely I tell you even the mm -hmm. so-and-so and the prostitute would, yeah. why did he say that right after that? Why do you think? Mm -hmm. No, I do know why. <laughs> but I want to <laughs> I wanna hear how you say okay. it. Mm -hmm. Well, if he's ta he, he just says, because the next day he knows he's going to be in trouble. Mm -hmm. So now he's, he wants to make it, he, w he wants to make it absolutely sure that everyone understands what he's, mm -hmm. so now he's actually interpreting the parables for the people. He says, I tell you the truth, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. Now, is that clear? Yes. For John the Baptist That's came right. to you showing you the right path to take and you would not believe him. Did they all know that was true? Yes. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. Even when you saw this, you did not later change your minds and believe him. And the problem is, he was right. What do you do with some, and, and everybody knows you're right, what do you do when you, it's pretty hard to condemn someone when you're perfectly well, he's telling the truth. That also remind me of the parable when he told the woman you don't throw pearls at dogs, yeah. and she said even the dogs eat from, good stuff. Eat the crumbs. Yeah. Well, that's, that's interesting good that stuff. the truth can actually insult people. Yes. And uh, is that very Christian, to insult people? Mm -hmm. Well. Yeah, but yet it's the truth. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, shock there you go. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you have to. I mean, do you? Th why do you think some of the Pharisees later became Christians? Mm. The Jewish leaders could see clearly that he was talking about them, but because he only told the stories in parable form, there was nothing specifically for which they can condemn him. And what about us? I mean, suppose that, suppose that, just suppose, as a, an alternate to the story, the Jews, Jewish leaders, just as he was speaking this parable, the Jewish leaders marched out and said, we're going to hold court right here. You people, you common, ordinary people, stand over here. You're going to be the jury. We're putting Jesus on trial. And they would have said, okay, you said this, yeah, okay. And what would the jury say? It's the truth, right? Wouldn't they? They knew it was the truth. So can you condemn somebody for telling the truth? You may not they like did. it. Hmm? They it's did. happened. They did. Well, yeah, it's not supposed to. <coughs> they did. The parable of the vineyard applies not alone to the Jewish nation. It has a lesson for us. These are Ellen White's words. The church in this generation has been endowed by God with great privileges and blessings. And he expects corresponding returns. Christ's Obby Lessons, page 296. And when she says that we are endowed with great blessings. What is she talking about? The word. I mean, you know, I can buy virtually everything, maybe more than I'll have a chance to read in my entire lifetime, on one cheap disc, the B Bibles and Ellen White and da-da-da. There it is. There it is, for a few dollars. And I can read, if I got a computer, I can read for the rest of my life. I can get it for free. On the internet. And that's also true. <laughs> but then you got to pay for the internet. Yeah, 
<laughs> While the Jews in the times of Jesus lived lives that were highly oriented to spiritual matters, now here's a challenge for us, we on the other hand are the most blessed generation of all time. Never have spiritual truths, various translations of the Bible, and for Adventists, the writings of Ellen White, been so readily available. If we can't understand some spiritual point in one translation, one version of things, we could go to a different translation, then it'll probably be clear. God is doing everything possible to get the message through to us at this critical time in human history. What excuses do we have for not taking time to learn the lessons? How many of us, through self-deception, have skipped over some really important spiritual lessons we should have learned? Remember that self-deception is the devil's forte. I mean, if there's anybody who has deceived himself to the ultimate extent, it's got to be the devil, right? Well, I don't think anybody, any of us would question the fact that the, the, the ministry of Jesus was the golden age of parable and storytelling. None of his disciples were as good at, at it as he was. But there are some examples. Romans 7, 1 to 6, 1 Corinthians 3, 10 to 15, 2 Corinthians 5, 1 to 10. Those are just some examples from Paul. Jesus' brother, James, also used some interesting illustrations or parables. Look at James 2, 2, 1, 10, 3, 4. Peter's vision in Acts 10 is a kind of parable. Now, who, who would you say told the parable of the the sheet that came down in vision. Who was the one who origi originated that parable? God. God. Yeah. Well, you, even Nebuchadnezzar, he's, his, his vision was a parable. Mm -hmm. You really think about it. Joseph. He didn't, he didn't understand it. Joseph's you know? dreams were parables. Yeah. Well, let's take something that's a little more pressing for our day. Do, are you sure you understand the messages of Revelation 18 and 19? All about the fall of Babylon. All about the rider on the white horse. Now with all this experience we have and we're this far down and the history has already happened, we ought to be experts, right? Ken, Ken, are there parables all around us and we just don't see it? Is, is nature full of parables? Yes. Are trees full of parables? Rivers Actually. full of parables? I Actually. don't want to get to be kind of spooky here, but <laughs> you know, I, uh, you know, in the, in the, in the sanctuary, mm -hmm. it's our understanding that everything in there was a, a, a symbol of Jesus or, or kind of a parable, I suppose. Many people want to carry that to the <coughs> ultimate degree, and that's probably pushing a little far, right. but yeah. But is it, uh, is that, is that because um, everything that God has created is just, uh, it's like Him? Points Would, to him. Point, well, points to Him, it reflect His nature, and He's We carried. hope so. It's, it's, it's interesting, too, that people are trying to prove God through science. I yeah. just wonder, you can't do that. You have to go the parable route, like what you're talking about. That's where you really find God. So when I look at a petunia, for example, should I be able to see, I'm not sure it's a pure parable, but... but uh, well, I can, I can, yeah. What, what can I say about uh, a, a, a petunia? Look at the colors. Those are fantastic colors. Just, just look at God, how God mixes colors. And God puts together colors that we wouldn't dare to put together. And they're gorgeous, right? I mean, I could tell you about some birds I used to watch in East Africa. They just, I mean, every square inch is almost a different color. It's a, or even a square centimeter. Just amazing. Mm -hmm. And they have different colors here and different colors there and different colors there. And I mean... And, and they never clash. And they never clash. <laughs> and, and they're iridescent. They change when they're in the sunlight. Well, Jesus desired... Here's Ellen White's words, Christ Off Lessons, page 20 and 21. Jesus desired to awaken inquiry. He wants us to do what? Think. He sought to arouse the careless and impress truth upon the heart. Parable teaching was popular and commanded the respect and attention not only of the Jews, 
but of the people of other nations. Were people from other nations attracted to Christ? Mm -hmm. How do we know? The Greeks said we would see Jesus. Yes. And people from what kind of places came to seek healing and learn from Jesus? I mean, we, we often think it was just Jews that were listening to him. Absolutely not. People came down from Tyre and Sidon and over from, up from the area of, of Caesarea Philippi and from over in the Decapolis. I mean, you know, especially if you have someone sick in your family and you know Jesus is a, not too far away over there. Maybe it's a day's walk, but so what if it's a day's walk? I mean, what are the kind of help is available, you know? A day's walk for those people was yeah. every day. Yeah. <laughs> Again, Jesus had truths to present which the people were unprepared to accept or even to understand. That's the dark speech that Gary's talking to us about. For this reason also he taught them in parables. By connecting his teachings with the scenes of life, experience, or nature, he secured their attention and impressed their hearts. Afterwards, they looked upon the objects that illustrated his lessons. They did what? They recalled the words of the divine teacher. Jesus sought an avenue to every heart. By using a variety of illustrations, he not only presented truth in its different phases, but appealed to the different hearers. Christ's Lessons 20 and 21. So, Jesus uses common things which everybody, with which everybody's familiar. What would he use today? Probably the internet. <laughs> the internet? Things okay. Deal with. What else would he talk, use, do you think? Know. You know, the Cars. people are, are so different nowadays. I mean, there's people that know about building rockets. There are people that know about, you know, painting or anything like that. There's just no way. I mean, the the possibilities of what he would use is just goes beyond I can think of. I'll, I'm sure Jesus would have some very interesting parables about computers. Mm -hmm. And it would depend on the audience, mm -hmm. too, that mm -hmm. he'd use them or not. Well, there's a very interesting story we can't spend a lot of time on, but look at it in Luke 16, starting with verse 19. How do we explain this one? There was once a rich man who dressed in the most expensive clothes and lived in great luxury every day. There was also a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who used to be brought to the rich man's door, hoping to eat the bits of food that fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. Does that sound like a great hygienic situation? <laughs> the poor man died and was carried by the angels to sit beside Abraham at the feast in heaven. Does that sound like we're telling a true story? The rich man died and was buried, and in Hades, what's another word for Hades? Hell. Hell. Where he was in great pain, he looked up and saw Abraham far away from with Lazarus at his side. So he called out, Father Abraham, take pity on me and send Lazarus to dip his finger in some water and cool my tongue, because I'm in great pain in this fire. But Abraham said, Remember my son, that in your lifetime you were given all the good things while Lazarus got all the bad things. But now he's enjoying himself here while you are in pain. Besides all that, there's a deep pit lying between us so that those who, are, who want to cross over from here to you cannot do so, nor can anyone cross over to, you, to, over to us from where you are. Is there really a deep pit somewhere that's so, so deep that God can't cross over? The rich man said, Then I beg you, Father Abraham, send Lazarus to my father's house where I have five brothers. Let him go and warn them so they at least will not come to this place of pain. Abraham said, Your brothers have Moses and the prophets to warn them. Your brothers shall listen to what they say. The rich man answered. What did he answer? That is not enough, Father Abraham. But if someone were to rise from death and go to them, then they would turn from their sins. But Abraham said, if they will not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be convinced even if someone were to rise from death. And the very interesting thing about this story is that the poor man's name was? Lazarus. And a very short time later, Jesus raised someone from the dead whose name was? Lazarus. Lazarus. 
Hmm. And it had no positive impact upon and, those religious leaders. And what impact did it have on them? Made them angry. Wanted to kill Lazarus, and then they, they wanted to, to kill, kill both again. of them. Now, yes, go ahead. wasn't this oh, go ahead. wasn't the, this parable spoken in Perea? Isn't the audience a little different here? Yes. Uh, of course, there's Jews around because there's a lot of Jewish talk in there, but yeah. um, it seems like he's he's kind of making my point here that that it depends on the audience what kind of parables he's going to use. To a certain extent, yes. But Go the punchline, oh. you got to get to the punchline of that original story is learn from Moses and the prophets. Yeah. He says even if somebody comes from the dead, it would have no positive impact on him. So that's, every time that story is told by others, they never get to the punchline. Yeah. That's the whole well, thing. It he's, seems like they want to prove another point. He's, yeah, the, they get involved in the details, and that isn't where the point is. The point is, is the hyperbole of the story mm -hmm. to get you to, get to the punchline. But many people have used this to I support know. their doctrine of hell. And right. why, why did the Holy Spirit inspire right. Luke to put this in? Wouldn't it just wouldn't it just been better to leave this story out? It's you created it so much out, confusion. Leave it out. Yeah. But it, it works if you if you get to the end of the story. Don't don't get fall asleep before you get there. <laughs> <It's> just, <laughs> <laughs> because it does have meaning because of what happened later with raising of Lazarus. Did um, how do you feel about using Jesus using fictional stories? Have you ever heard a pastor use fictional stories? No. Well, somebody told me, and he believed up and down, that all of Jesus' stories were true. All of them. I and then I showed him fun. this one, and he, he couldn't. <laughs> well. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, a little problem with this one. Yeah, yeah that one has a. Have you ever tried to compose a parable? Let me help you. I think so. We the kingdom of heaven is like. Mustard seed. <laughs> like, Try it sometime. Like green cheese. Why? I think we do that with our children without even realizing it. I'm done that. I'll figure out something, but just give me some time <laughs> to think about it. Try to use modern situations. <laughs> Try to use illustrations that would be appropriate for people in our, you know, postmodern society. See if you can put together a parable. Mm -hmm. Interesting. The kingdom of heaven is like a cell phone. Okay. It, or a uh, machine. It, uh, a computer. You just dial yes. the number and you get God, right? No, it <laughs> ring, <laughs> rings with important messages. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and a lot of junk, too, sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. It tells you things. <coughs> One woman in the Bible told a good parable. Yeah. Uh, that woman from Tekoa. Yeah, more yeah. than one. Yeah. That was yeah. good. Well... Um, yeah. Do you think Jesus thought up all these parables himself, or did every night in prayer, did he and the Father and the Holy Spirit plan for the next day? Oh, how can you answer that question? Come on now, let's, no, let's no venture way. out a little bit. There's so many ways that, that parables can come to somebody and yeah. say which one is just, how can you, but how we, can you even? But we do know that Jesus spent many nights in prayer with God. That's right, absolutely, but it still doesn't change my point. But Jesus almost always left his parables open-ended. Why do you think he did that? What do you mean open-ended? Yeah, what do you mean open-ended? The, the, the story doesn't end. I mean, the, take, take the most, probably the most important parable of all, the, the parable of the prodigal son. Yeah. And what happens? The father is out there trying to convince the older brothers he should come into the feast, and that's all there is. If you if you brought it to a a tight conclusion, if, the if, if, over. If, yeah, if this way it, it gets you thinking, and and you can find more applications and over time. So. so what is he trying to say to us? The rest of the story come depends back. upon you, hey, listener. The rest of the story depends upon the listener. Well, some experts who deal with personal evangelism all the time, we're running out of time here, have suggested that one of the best ways to start out is to give a personal experience. 
I mean, it's pretty hard for someone to argue with your personal experience. I mean, uh, they may disagree with your interpretation of it, but at least they, if you say, this is what happened to me, they'll say, oh, yeah, okay. So, uh, what about it? If you, try to, if you try to develop a modern story, do you have to sort of dress it up in, by using media? Or can you just tell a story? Well, even with the media, the story is everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, even with the fancy fancy uh, movies they have right now, if it's got a bad story, mm -hmm. the whole thing's bad, no matter how, what they put in it, what effects or whatever. H has the Bible lost its punch? <coughs> hmm. Is it difficult to get people's interest <coughs> in the Bible stirred up you, when there's so much attention getting TV and internet material to look at and listen? You don't read it, there's no punch. Well, but I mean, we want the whole message to happen in 50 seconds. We want a sound bite. Right? Well, <laughs> if you can't say it in five minutes, people won't listen. Well, the sower in the field. We don't have time to go back and read the whole thing while well, we looked at a part of, already part of it. Um, is God wasteful when he scatters seed and some of it falls on the stony ground and some of it falls among the weeds? Isn't that a waste? It's illustrative. Of what? Well, of the stories, yeah. But, I mean, if you were, if you were a careful farmer, wouldn't you say, well, let me just scatter my feed in, seed in the right place? Of course, the response to that should be that God has an infinite supply of seed. <laughs> right? <laughs> Who, yeah, says, it, who says God is the sower here? It, it could be... I'm just, just asking. <laughs> <coughs> what, what should we learn about God from the seed itself? And what about the different soils? Again, we're running out of time, but try to put yourself in each one of those situations. Try to imagine that you're the farmer. Try to imagine that you're the seed. Try to imagine that you're one of those types of soil. Which kind of soil would you make? Do you really believe... You don't have to tell me, me or anybody else. Which type of soil do you really believe you are? Well, it was pretty clear to Jesus' original readers that some of these stories were pretty pointed. And some of them were pretty, they didn't really want to hear them. And sometimes it's like that. But our challenge from this lesson is to think about ways in which we can reach out using stories to influence others. Try it.